Well, aloha everyone, and welcome to Human Nutrition at Chaminade University. My name is Dr. Genevieve Griffiths, and today we will be doing an introduction to nutrition. So the learning outcomes for this entire semester include discussing the factors that drive our food choices, defining the term nutrition, and identification of the essential nutrients. We will describe the primary roles of those essential nutrients that are found in your food and discuss the best dietary approaches to meet the nutrient needs of the individual. We will also summarize how a healthy diet can improve the health of the individual. And then we'll discuss the ABCD method, which is used to assess the nutrient status both of individuals and of populations. We'll discuss the current nutritional state of the average American diet, which as you can imagine is subpar in several ways. We will also describe the scientific method that we use to lead um, and learn reliable and accurate nutritional information. And then we'll explain how to identify reliable information and most importantly, how to recognize misinformation. And while we, we, we will be talking about this in the context of nutrition, this is something that will be beneficial in your everyday life as well because there's a lot of misinformation out there at the moment and it's important to be able to interpret what is real information that's backed up by solid facts and sources and what is either propaganda or sometimes things can be misleading and sometimes they can be outright false. So let's talk about what drives our food choices. There's several different things, and we'll talk about each of them independently, but taste and enjoyment first and foremost. What do you like to eat and what makes you happy, right? So there are certain things that are your happy foods, things that you eat when you feel certain ways, right? Emotional foods. Um, we also can make our food choices based on our culture and our environment. So if you were raised on certain foods, you might have a tendency to go back to those certain foods, even if they don't necessarily taste good to you or to other people, particularly medicinal foods that you might have had as a child, etc., or things that were just kind of nurturing when you were younger. Also, social life and trends can help influence your food choices. It's always easier to eat more food when you're out at a restaurant with a bunch of friends just chatting. Um, and nutritional knowledge can also help drive our food choices. The more you know, the better equipped you are to be able to make intelligent nutritional decisions. Advertising plays a big role in how we choose what we eat. In fact, there's an entire scheme of marketing that is designed specifically to making you decide what you want to eat based on what they think you want to eat. Um, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. This one is a big one for me, time, convenience, and cost. When you're working full-time or you guys are going to school full-time, sometimes it just becomes really difficult to put the time aside to be able to make a home-cooked meal. And so it's much easier or more convenient to order pizza or go through a drive through um, And also, oftentimes, the fast food actually has a lower cost than more healthy food. However, when you think of it in just the terms of the money, that might be true. But if you think about it in terms of the caloric intake, it's actually got lower nutritional value. So the cost to your body is that you are losing the nutrients that you ought to be getting through eating. And last but not least, several sets of habits and emotions can also drive our food choices. We have specific foods that we eat when we're happy or we eat when we're sad, right? Or perhaps every time that you finish a specific hike, you always stop and get a particular manapua somewhere, right? Um, and so sometimes you have habits that are linked to your eating choices. So to elaborate on each of these, let's talk about taste and enjoyment. So most people would agree that taste and texture influence their food choices. In fact, taste is considered the most important factor in food selection. And your preferences for what you like begin early, early on in life and are often culturally specific. So whether you have a preference for sweets or for high fats or for spicy foods or specific textures, that often begins very early in life. An example for this is something called poi here in the Hawaiian Islands. It's a taro plant that's been ground up or pounded usually um, into a mush and it's fed to children early on in life. And it's something that they, that island natives will later on refer to as a comfort food, right? They'll go back to it when they're feeling sick or when they're feeling sad. It's something that they would eat um, as that might not be something that someone from the mainland would choose to eat. In fact, people from the mainland who come here who didn't have that as children often don't really acquire a taste for it as adults. So your preferences for what you choose to eat often begin early on in your lifetime. Oftentimes, salty and sweet are the most preferred, and that's because glucose is what we use mainly in our metabolism, and so it'll give you a boost of energy. Also, salts are things that we need as well. Oftentimes, you crave what you are either lacking or what you are using very quickly, but your taste preferences start in infancy and start to change as you age. 
So a good example of the changing as you age would be something like Brussels sprouts or mushrooms, which many individuals don't like under the age of 12. And then after 12 to 15, you actually start to lose a subset of your taste buds that have a very the ability to taste very bitter flavors. And so after time, you can start tasting the other t flavors in the mushrooms or in the Brussels sprouts. Um, another example of influencing by genetics, for example, would be some cultural specificity for people of Indian or Chinese descent to be able to handle much more um, of a hot flavor and actually be able to taste the flavor of the pepper instead of just tasting the overwhelming heat behind the pepper. Um, and so depending on what your genetics prevail and also what your home life fed you when you were younger and what age you are, you can have a different degree of preference for what you like to eat. Um, but all humans across the board have a taste for fat. We do know that this is genetically linked, so individuals in cold climates have a more of a taste for fat. This is because they have to have more layers on their skin to be able to survive the cold winter, and also oftentimes in the winter food is scarce, and so they may end up ending up with large long periods of almost starvation conditions. And so in order to survive that, they have to have fat on their bodies from the um, months when they are able to acquire food. And so individuals in colder climates tend to have more of a taste for fatty foods. Um, and texture plays a really big role in what you like to eat or don't like to eat. In fact, almost 30% of adults report that they dislike slippery foods, and I'm in that category. I don't like flan, although I like the flavor. I don't like pudding. Um, in fact, I like rice pudding because it has something in it besides just that slippery texture. Um, so most people um, have a preference for their food based on their taste and on the texture. But as I mentioned previously, other things also influence your food choices, such as your cultural background, right? What you grew up eating is a comfort food for you. Um, and also, it can your genetics and your cultural background can influence whether you're able to stand, like I mentioned, those spicy foods, etc. Often your environmental factors also affect the type of food and the amount of food that are um, that's being eaten. For example, if you live in a really hot place that's not near the desert or not near the ocean, I mean, you are very unlikely to have a high fish diet, right? Because fish, by the time they get to the desert, are going to have already spoiled. So your accessibility to the food is going to change your preferences as well as your availability of that food. Um, and also, there's a whole marketing subset that. Um, dedicated directly to the packaging of your food. So the environment of the food, the way the food is packaged, the way the food is presented as it's lit up in certain ways. That's why oftentimes when you see food display cases, they're going to be lit from underneath the shelf shining down on the food so that it looks appealing to you. And they have pr picked specific sizes and shapes of the plates and the glassware for presentation purposes so that the food looks appealing to the consumer. Additionally, they've demonstrated that group size can drastically affect the amount of food that you eat. In fact, meal size has been demonstrated to increase by over 40% when you eat with others. So if you eat in a restaurant, in fact, if you eat with a larger group, that can increase up to 60% as you're eating with more and more and more people because the larger the group size, the more likely you are to order more food. Even just considering the fact that if you were to eat with one other person, you might order an appetizer as well as your entrees, when normally you would each only order one entree. That in and of itself would increase your meal size by approximately 40%, but sometimes you might eat up to almost two meals because you want to try a little bit of everything. Um, activities also play a role in this. Your food activity increases when you, I'm sorry, your food intake increases when you are participating in an activity. So for example, if you're sitting in a movie theater with your friends, you're more likely to eat popcorn than you would by yourself. Um, and you, for example, at a buffet, at a party, you might be more likely to graze and continue to try just so you could try new things that you hadn't had before. But once you try one of each of them, it equals an entire meal, even though you haven't really noticed that because you're just grazing. Um, so your activities your active level and your social interaction can change, can influence how much food you're eating. Additionally, some popular trends also affect food choices. In the 1950s, frozen vegetables were preferred um, rather than fresh ones because instead of having to go to the grocery store and buy them, you could just take it directly out of the freezer. It makes it a lot easier and convenient. They also had things like TV dinners, which weren't delicious but were super easy, and so they were preferred over the hand-cooked meals. Um, today, an example of that would be if you were to purchase pre-washed vegetables that were peeled and sliced and diced and ready to go. Um, and also today, one of the major trends that you may hear is the term organic food. Foods. Um, and we'll talk in a little bit about how I dislike the term organic when we talk to our food supply. Um, organic simply just means that it has a carbon backbone. And um, things like water, for example, which are just hydrogen and oxygen, that's an inorganic molecule. So there's a lot of inorganic molecules like water inside your food. So calling it organic is 
really interesting when really what you mean is that it hasn't been sprayed by pesticides, which incidentally, some of those pesticides happen to be organic molecules as well because they have carbon backbones. So the whole thing to me feels a little bit confusing, but I will step off of my soapbox now and move on. Um, Nutritional knowledge is very important when helping to decide what kind of foods you're going to choose to eat. Um, certain foods are perceived as healthy or unhealthy, and when you have a knowledge of what you think is healthy or unhealthy, you're more likely to make decisions um, to help lean towards the side of what you believe to be healthy. Um, however, that actually changes over time. There was a time when they thought eggs were very unhealthy for you. Now it's demonstrated that eggs are healthy for you. Same thing with butter. They said butter was very bad for you. Now it's coming out that margarine is actually also bad for you in certain ways. So the perception of what things being healthy or unhealthy changes with the times as well. However, some things are pretty much standard. Like you should try to avoid high sodium foods, for example, to help reduce your blood pressure. And that's pretty much held true across many ages or eras. Additionally, um, your current state of health also affects your food choices. So if you're overweight, you might be trying to lean more towards the lean side. If you're um, underweight, you might be trying to put some weight on. Um, if you're at healthy weight, you might avoid foods that are associated with weight gain or loss. Now, advertising plays a really big role in the food choices. In fact, this is very interesting that if you notice, almost all of our mascots for any of your food products are all cartoon characters, right? Tony the Tiger, um, particularly for children's cereals, actually, things like the, the Trix Rabbit or Lucky Charms has that leprechaun, right? All of these things are things that are very important to children, right? They're used to cartoons on TV, and so they're actually influencing the children's decisions and therefore influencing their parents' decisions. Manufacturers spend 10 to 15 billion annually on food advertising, and that's why when you go to Safeway, you buy the, the more wherever food land, and you buy this store brand, and it costs two thirds of the price of the other product, it's not that the product is less quality, it's that the store brands don't spend money on advertising, and so they're able to offer that product at a much lower price because they're not putting it into commercials. Most of the advertising dollars are spent on what we call um, impulse buys, it's things that are at the end of the aisle, like candy, gum, sodas. But that's also going to be spent heavily on breakfast cereals, again, targeting the children, who then target the wallets of the parents. You'll note that advertising for things like fruits and vegetables is very rare, um, and that's because typically the people who eat fruits and vegetables don't have to be told to eat fruits and vegetables, and there's no real need for marketing. How, additionally, you'll notice that fruits and vegetables have a higher price point than some of these other prepackaged foods, and that's because part of the price point includes product that might be thrown away that ends up rotting on the shelves. All right, so let's talk about time, convenience, and cost. Obviously, you want to try to mitigate how much time you spend on these meals, as well as how convenient it is for you to cook at home versus eating out, and the cost involved. And time and convenience is those super important factors for those that have busy schedules, right? I have two small children, and I also work for full time, so it's very um, tempting to just run through the drive through on the way home instead of going home and making a meal. But to counter that argument, I want to make it clear that the average time spent preparing a meal, including the cleanup, which is the part that I dread the most, is washing the dishes, is less than 30 minutes. So realistically, you do have the time. You just have the perception that you don't have the time. Additionally, to help with this trend, supermarkets are tailoring to individuals who want prepared foods or partially prepared foods. So you can stop by the Safeway, for example, and pick up an entirely cooked chicken or a meatloaf or whatnot and take that home, and it would be similar to a home-cooked meal, even though it wouldn't be a thoroughly a home-cooked meal. People eat out today overall a lot more than they did a few decades ago, although obviously this was written pre-COVID. Um, however, it the trend still remains that from the 50s to the 60s to the 70s, every decade, people tend to eat out a little bit more than their parents did. And that means that they're putting more of their money into the restaurant's pocket than into their own home budget, simply for the fact of the time and the convenience, right? Um, additionally, the cost is factored in. Oftentimes, fast foods are perceived to be cheaper than nutritious foods, and therefore they're selected more often. Um, but the problem with the fast foods is that they're high in fat and high in calories, but low in nutrients. So you end up still feeling hungry afterwards because although your body has filled the actual mass of food into its stomach, it hasn't given itself the nutrients that it needs for its metabolism. And so that means that excessive fast food consumption can increase your risk for obesity because you tend to overeat because you're in search of nutrients that you're not getting. Um, and so when you think about the fact that they're cheaper, they might be cheaper in cost, but they're not going to be as healthy for you. And so it's not going to be, you're, basically your bang for your buck is going to be much lower.
It's also been demonstrated that if you lower the price of the nutritious foods, individuals are much more likely to purchase the nutritious foods um, than they are when they, the price is a little bit cost prohibitive. Additionally, your habits and emotions influence what you eat. Now, in general, your daily routine and your habits are kind of set in stone, but every once in a while, you have an emotional eating event, right? Something makes you very happy, or you go home and you have mom's home-cooked, for me, it's lasagna, whatever it is that is your home-cooked meal that you go back to and that makes you happy, or you get very sad, you go through a breakup, something happens, someone dies, and you end up eating a tub of ice cream or something like that. So oftentimes, your um, food choices can be driven by extreme emotions, but in general, they're going to be driven by your daily routine and the habits that you set for yourself. Which is actually very good because that means that your habits can be something that you change if you want to make a choice to have a healthier lifestyle. So what is nutrition? So throughout this class, we're going to be talking about human nutrition. So nutrition is defined as the science that studies how nutrients and compounds in the food nourish the body and affect body functions and your overall health. And there's several different steps to what happens to food once it's being consumed. So the first thing, of course, you consume it. Then it ends up in your stomach. Now it's going to get digested. So digested means broken down into smaller pieces. After that, it has to get absorbed. So it has to go through the intestinal or the stomach lining and get picked up by the bloodstream where it's going to be transported wherever it's going to be utilized. And when it's utilized, it undergoes the process of metabolism first, so it's going to get changed a little bit, and then it's either going to get utilized or stored by the body. And so basically the nutrition is the exploration of how food undergoes all of these processes through the process of um, consumption all the way to excretion. So what are nutrients? Right? So nutrients are biomolecules. They're compounds that you find in your food that are the small little building blocks or monomers for whatever body compartments that they're going to create and are used to sustain your body processes. We have many different types of nutrients that are found in the body that are also found in food, which is used to nourish the body. And the six categories of nutrients are carbohydrates, which also includes simple sugars, fats or lipids, Proteins, which are comprised of amino acids. Vitamins, which are small biomolecules that often help in biomolecular pathways. Minerals, which are going to be single elements. And water, right? H2O. So food contains non-nutrient compounds as well, things like non-digestible fiber that's just going to help pass through your body, and also chemicals that have been added oftentimes by food manufacturers. Oftentimes they're added to enhance your color or the flavor or to add that texture. Remember, some adults don't like slippery textures, so they might add something to thicken it up um, or to soften it. And um, that also preservatives to help extend our shelf life. So oftentimes chemicals are added by the food manufacturers to extend our shelf life, and that's important because the longer the shelf life, the lower the cost of the item because you have less trash to factor in, right? Less food that gets wasted to factor in. So for example, something like bananas, right? The price point for the 100 bananas that make it to the shelf is the same point um, if you get all 100 bananas eaten, but if if only 50 bananas get eaten, now it's double the cost to get those bananas to the shelf. So every banana is going to increase incrementally based on the amount of waste, which means that if you're able to put some sort of preservative into your food and increase the shelf life, you can reduce the waste and also therefore decrease the cost. Um, and the most important or abundant nutrient that we find in foods and in the body is water. Water, as I may remind you, is an inorganic molecule. It's H2O. The rest of the comprise the um, nutrients of the body are going to be carbohydrates, fats, proteins, vitamins, and minerals. Um, and carbohydrates that we consume in our diet are going to come entirely from plant-based sources because by the time the plants make it into the animals, the carbohydrates that are consumed by the animals are then digested and metabolized by the animals. So by the time we eat the animals, all we get is the animal protein or mainly just the animal proteins and fats. So by the time we consume animal foods, there's no more carbohydrates left. This is showing you a breakdown of the percentage of certain nutrients in foods like chicken breast and broccoli and in the human body. So you see the human body is approximately 60% water, 20% fat, 17% protein, and then small little slivers of minerals, vitamins, and carbohydrates. Now if you notice chicken breast, it's going to be much higher in protein, 22%, than say broccoli, which has just a small little amount. Um, broccoli is going to be higher in water, 89%, chicken breast, 74%. So every different food that you eat is going to provide a different amount of certain biomolecules, like carbohydrates, in this case, going to be higher in the broccoli than in the chicken breast. So you're going to want to try to make sure that you eat multiple different types of food to make sure that you're not only meeting your caloric needs, but also your nutritional needs.
Now, most of the nutrients that we consume are organic. Now, when I say organic, again, I don't mean that it hasn't been sprayed by pesticides and it's not GMO. What I mean when I say organic is that it has a carbon backbone. Anything that has a carbon backbone in its chemical structure is considered to be organic. Again, that excludes water. Organic nutrients are going to include things like carbohydrates, proteins, lipids, and vitamins. And our inorganic nutrients are going to include minerals. Again, these are single element compounds. I'm sorry, single elements, not compounds. Um, and water, which is going to be H2O. All right, so if you look at the chemical composition of the six classifications of the nutrients in food, right, and that's going to be carbohydrates, lipids, proteins, vitamins, minerals, and water. These four are going to contain carbon, these five contain hydrogen, these five contain um, oxygen, nitrogen is found in proteins and in some minerals, and the single elements are going to be found as trace elements in the minerals. Now essential nutrients are going to be the nutrients that you cannot get externally, right? You cannot make them in the body, and I'm sorry, you cannot get them internally. You must get them externally. I apologize. You have to get them from food consumption. You cannot make them in the body in sufficient quantities to be able to meet the body's needs and to support the individual's health. Those are considered essential nutrients. Now we also have non-essential nutrients, which are nutrients that we can manufacture in our body in sufficient qualities to meet our requirements, um, our daily metabolic requirements, and also to support our health. However, sometimes non-essential nutrients can become essential. They're called conditionally essential nutrients. So for example, if we end up depleted of certain nutrients, we will have to get more of that nutrient from an exogenous source. So a non-essential nutrient can become essential if we end up running really low on the reserves of that nutrient. Again, those are called conditionally essential nutrients. All right, so let's define energy. We're going to talk a lot about energy this semester. Um, energy is defined as the capacity to do work. And when we think of energy, we think of um, physical energy, like actually moving something around or running around the gymnasium, et cetera, or maybe light energy. Um, but we also have energy inside our bodies that's happening when we run our metabolic processes. And in that case, that energy is actually going to be stored in the triphosphate bond of ATP or adenosine triphosphate. So you'll see this is ATP or triphosphate. You'll also see ADP or diphosphate. Um, TP or tri being the higher energy form, DP or diphosphate being the lower energy form. And basically when that bond is made, it stores energy. And when the bond is broken, the energy is released. And some energy yielding nutrients include things like carbohydrates, which get broken down, um, lipids, etc. Proteins all get broken down and every time they get broken down, energy is released. And we also have energy sources that are non-nutrient based, something like alcohol, for example, which will provide energy. So it will provide enough energy for ATP to be created, but it will not provide any nutrients for the body. All right. So when we talk about burning calories, you're pretty much always talking about this uppercase C. And the uppercase C is actually a kilocalorie, right? Um, a kilocalorie is going to be 1,000 of the lowercase calories. So if you're using a lowercase c, you're actually 1,000 fold less than the uppercase c. So although it seems very similar, it's a thousand fold difference. And how do we define a kilocalorie? So a kilocalorie is defined as the amount of energy that you need to raise the temperature of a kilogram of water by one degree Celsius. And a calorie, a lower C, right, is the amount of energy required to raise the temperature of one gram of water, one degree Celsius. Do you see what I did there? I took the 1,000 and divided it by 1,000, right? And I took one kilogram and I divided that by 1,000 as well. So in order to go from uppercase C to lowercase C, you divide by 1,000. For, to go from a kilogram to a gram, you also divide by 1,000. So if you were to look at the amount of energy for a lower C, you would only need that amount of energy required to raise one gram of water, one degree Celsius. And this is the way in which we use, um, this is the way in which we express the amount of energy that's found in foods. And you're going to see this on your um, FDA labels when you take the lab, and we're going to be able to interpret how we get that energy by looking at the different nutrients that are inside that food. So each energy yielding nutrient provides a certain amount of kilocalories per gram. For example, carbohydrates, they yield four kilocalories. Proteins also four kilocalories. Fat, however, is going to yield double that. So one gram of fat is going to yield double the amount of calories of one gram of protein. So fat's going to yield nine kilocalories. And you will need to know this when you do some math later on. Um, fair game for the exam would be to have to know how many kilocalories per gram fat, protein, and carbohydrates yield.
Alcohol, as I mentioned, is a non-nutrient, and it does provide kilocalories at the rate of about 7 kcal per gram. All right, so what you're going to have to do for the exam is calculate the amount of kilocalories in a given meal. So we'll walk you through right now how to do that. So if you were to eat a meal of consisting of potato chips and a 16-ounce cola, those two items together would contain 144 grams of carbohydrates combined from the cola and the chips, 12 grams of protein found from the chips, and 60 grams of fat that are found in the chips. So how would you do that? All right, so we know the carbohydrates... We have to multiply by 4, so we take 144, and we multiply by 4 kcals per gram. The 12 grams of protein, we're also going to multiply by 4, 12 grams by 4 kcal, and then we're going to add to that the 60 grams of fat multiplied by 9 kcals, and that's going to give us a total of 1,164 kcals, right? And so if you add all this up, right, 144 times 4 is 576. 12 times 4 is 48, 60 times 9 is 540, that's going to give you a total of 1,164 kcals. And as you may know, the kilocalories in a normal individual's diet are somewhere between 2,200 for us females and 2,500 for males, depending on your age. And so just this one snack could consume almost half of your daily calories. Um, and if we wanted to, for example, add a beer to this, and it would tell you the amount of alcohol or maybe a shot would make it easier because there would also be carbohydrates in the beer but, but it would tell you the about say we added a shot of vodka that would be x amount of volume of vodka of um, grams of alcohol and you would multiply that by seven k cows per gram because as we mentioned previously alcohol gives you seven k cows per gram all right so my point here is that you, you have to be very careful about how you utilize that 2200 calories to 2500 calories per day it's very easy for them to get lost in something like a simple snack or in grazing habits so here's another calculation that we could run. The question that we're asking now is, what percentage of this snack came from fat? And you can't just do that by grams of fat divided by total grams in the food, right? Because grams of fat actually give you more calories than grams of protein or grams of carbohydrates. But what you can do, if you go backwards, you can see this 540 kcals, that's from fat, that's from that 60 grams of fat. And if you divide the one of the 540, by 1164, which is the total amount that was in that meal, that equals 46% fat. So almost half of the calories in the snack are from fat, which is obviously not exactly the most desirable proportion. All right, so again, it's fair game on the exam for me to ask you what percentage of that meal came from which of the, of the biomolecules, whether it be protein or carbohydrates or fats. All right, so how is energy in the body kept? Well, as I mentioned, it's held within these bonds. And when bonds break, energy is released. When bonds are made, energy is stored. And we use energy for multiple different bodily functions. And the needs of our, our energy needs are going to vary according to multiple different things. Age, the older you are, um, the lower your energy needs. Uh, your gender, so males are going to require more energy than females, just as a basal metabol metabolic rate. Um, and also your activity level, those people who have a higher level of metabolic act or higher level of exercise as a general rule are going to have a higher metabolic activity as a basal metabolic rate. Um, anytime that you have unused energy, it's going to get stored. Now remember, it's calories in, calories out. So when more calories come in than calories go out, it's going to be stored in the form of fats. And if more calories go out than come in, the energy is going to be leaving the body, which means it's going to have to be consumed, resulting in fat breakdown. All right, so we have specialized nutrients that have particular roles inside the body. Some of them will supply energy, some will provide structure, some will regulate your metabolism. We also have macronutrients. Macronutrients are going to be nutrients that the body needs in large amounts, things like the carbohydrates, the fats, the proteins, the water we just talked about. Um, the micronutrients are things like vitamins and minerals. We need them in small amounts, and um, although we do need them, we can, we can end up having high levels of them can be toxic. So we want to make sure that we have very small amounts of them in our body. They're considered micronutrients. And for the purposes of this class, yes, even those of you who are online at home, we will each be making a, a specific PowerPoint presentation on a vitamin or a mineral. It will be a 15-minute talk, and we will be providing those micronutrient presentations via Zoom. Um, so a little bit more on that will be posted online in a little bit. And if you look at the schedule, you can see which days are expected to be student presentation days. 
So I will be assigning a micronutrient and a presentation day to everyone um, in the next coming weeks. All right, so back to the lecture. So macronutrients include things like par carbohydrates, proteins, fats, and water. Um, carbohydrates and proteins and fats all provide energy. Water obviously does not provide energy, but it is required for all the metabolic processes. These metabolic processes could be things like growth, maintenance, support, um, or structure in the body. And as you may see, carbohydrates, while they provide energy, they don't participate in that process or in regulation of these processes. But proteins, fats, and waters are all responsible for participating in regulating the body processes. Micronutrients are also involved in um, growth, maintenance, structure, regulation of body processes, but neither vi vitamins or minerals are going to provide energy to the body. All right, so the primary energy source for the body are carbohydrates. So fat is the primary storage energy source and the primary immediate energy source would be carbohydrates. And they're composed of, again, hydrogen, carbon, and oxygen. The fact that they have carbon in there makes them um, an organic molecule. And the function is that they supply glucose, and glucose being sugar or C6H12O6. Um, glucose is a molecule that is the primary energy source for most of the cells in the body. That includes important cells like the red blood cells and your brain cells. And you can find it from plants and animal products. Um, in the animal, the only place that you can find carbohydrates are going to be in your dairy products. In the plants, you can find it in breads, cereals, things like legumes, um, like peanuts, for example, nuts, fruits, and vegetables. Lipids also provide energy to the body. They're composed also of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. That also makes them organic molecules. We have three major categories of lipids, triglycerides, sterols, and phospholipids. And they function to provide energy to the cells and are the major structural component for cell membranes. The food sources for the lipids include things like margarine, butters, oils, and animal products. Now, proteins also help provide building blocks for tissue synthesis. Proteins are actually going to be comprised of amino acids. And amino acids are comprised of, again, carbon, hydrogen, oxygen, but they also have nitrogen and some sulfur in there. And these amino acids um, link together to make peptides, which then a long peptide eventually becomes a protein. And proteins have a ton of different functions within the body. So proteins are um, used as a primary source to create tissue, creates muscles, bones and skin. They're also utilized in neurotransmissions. They're helping in the nervous system. They play a role in the immune system. They act as enzymes. Um, and also they are an energy source. They're not a primary energy source, but they are also an energy source. Um, here it says they contribute to the basic building blocks, and that's not exactly correct, although I guess in terms of digestion it is, because if you digest other proteins from other animals that get broken down as the basic building blocks that then we use. Um, but really what I would say is proteins are comprised of amino acids, and the amino acids come together to make the proteins that are then used for maintenance of tissue, etc. Proteins are found in animal and plant sources. Um, they're found in meat, poultry, fish, dairy sources from the animal, also in plants, things like soy, nuts, and seeds. Um, we get very small amounts of protein, but you do get some protein from things like whole grains, vegetables, and some fruits as well. Now let's talk about vitamins and minerals. So minerals are just the mineral itself. It's a single element. Vitamins are organic molecules. They're composed of carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. Um, neither one of these are going to provide energy, but they both are involved in the regulation of your metabolism. And if you have a deficiency in a particular vitamin or mineral, that can cause all sorts of effects, including fatigue, stunted growth, weak bones, and internal organ damage. So when you give your talk on your micronutrients, one of the things that you'll be asked to think about is the A, the lethal dose, so how much is too much, and also how little is too little. What happens when you become deficient in your micronutrients? Um, so vitamins serve as coenzymes. That means that they help other enzymes in the body function, and enzymes serve to catalyze certain reactions, so these coenzymes help catalyze the reactions. We have two different classifications of... Um, we have two different classifications of vitamins, so the water-soluble and the fat-soluble vitamins. Um, the water-soluble vitamins are not stored in the body for very long, and they're going to flush out of the body when you have them in excess, so you're going to need to consume them um, quite often. You're going to need to consume them on the, every day. These are going to include the B-complex vitamins and your vitamin C. Now, we also have fat-soluble vitamins. 
These vitamins are going to be stored within the body. These vitamins are going to be able to be something that you can have toxic levels of because they're going to bioaccumulate. And they're going to include things like vitamin A, D, E, and K. We also have minerals in the body. Minerals serve to assist the body processes. Um, we have major and trace minerals. So major would mean that you need at least 100 milligrams a day and you need at least 5 grams in the body. Trace would mean that you have less than 100 milligrams consumption per day and they're found in lower than 5 grams in the body. Now water is going to be super critical within the body, particularly for nutrition and for molecular functions. It makes up the majority of all the body fluids. It's a part of every cell in the body. And it's essential during metabolism, digestion, and absorption. It's a transport medium that's going to be able to take things like your oxygen and your nutrients to your cells and also take things like carbon dioxide and cellular waste away from your cells through the bloodstream and help excrete through the urine. It helps maintain your body temperature because it has a high specific heat. It helps lubricate your body, including places like your eyes, your intestinal tract, your joints, your mouth, cushions your internal organs and is something that we cannot store, so you must constantly replenish your water. All right, so the best way that you can meet your nutritional needs is to have a diet that's what's considered well-balanced. So what does well-balanced mean? It means that you should contain a variety of different whole foods, things like whole grains, whole fruits and vegetables, lean meats, <coughs> excuse me, low fats, and, and low dairy. It should also provide other dietary compounds that are beneficial to human health. Things like zoo chemicals, fiber, and phytochemicals. All right, so food that provides additional health benefits beyond the basic nutrient value is going to be something considered functional foods. And phytochemicals are any sort of non-nutritive plant chemicals that are found in foods that are going to help reduce the risk of developing a chronic disease. And currently, there's known to be over 900 different phytochemicals found in foods that help work together with other nutrients to help fight off or stave off disease. Now, zoo chemicals are animal compounds that are non-nutritive but are also known to play a role in fighting chronic disease states. Something like eating omega-3 fatty acids from fish can help improve your heart health and reduce inflammation. Now, some nutrient needs can be met with a supplement, so sometimes you can just take a supplement of whatever it is that you're lacking. And supplements are very beneficial for individuals that are not able to meet their nutrient needs with whole foods alone, so someone who is lacking in a particular nutrient in their diet. Um, so for example, someone who has a lactose intolerance might have a very difficult time meeting their calcium needs because most of the calcium that we intake in our diet comes from dairy products with their are unable to eat. Um, and so you, they might take an exogenous calcium supplement to be able to meet their calcium needs. So how can you use your diet to improve your health? Well, top, first and foremost, aim for good nutrition always. Good nutrition reduces the risk of most of the leading causes of death. Well, four of the top ten. It helps prevent harmful diseases and conditions, and it helps reduce the risk of developing chronic disorders like obesity, diabetes mellitus, and high blood pressure. So of the top 10 major causes of death, these four are related to bad nutrition, heart disease, cancer, strokes, and diabetes. So we can reduce or eliminate the top four causes of death simply by good dietary control. Now, additionally, some people have different genetic risks, um, but genetics and nutrition both combine to impact your health risks. So if you do have genetic risks, it's even more important that you have better nutrition to help offset those genetic risks. So most of the chronic diseases are going to stem from both genetic makeup, so predisposition, um, also our environment, so what happens around us, our surroundings, and our diet. So while we might have a gene that is going to make us more susceptible to disease, we can sometimes help offset that by making sure that our diet is wholesome and healthy. So there's a whole entire field called nutritional genomics, which studies the interrelationship between the expression of your genes, your dietary needs, right, your nutrition, and your health. So how do we as assess nutritional status? So there's four different states of nutrition. Um, the first state is healthy. The second is malnourished. 
the other is undernourished, and the last state would be overnourished. And we as the Americans all tend to fall, many of us fall into this overnourished category. And as a licensed um, degree, you can get a, become a registered dietitian nutritionist. That's called an RDN. And so you get a degree, college degree in nutrition, from a nutrition academy, and you pass an exam, and that makes you capable of helping others determine their nutritional status and help give them dietary recommendations. All right, so these are the ABCs of nutritional assessment. The first is anthropometric, and that's going to include measurements, things like your height, your weight, your body mass index, your waist to hip ratio, waist circumference, etc. And that's going to help determine your growth rate, if you're in, still in the growth stage, your obesity, changes in weight, and risks of developing chronic diseases such as diabetes and heart disease. We also have a biochemical assessment which measures blood, urine, and feces, and it can help determine your protein status, mineral status, and vitamin status. And all of these have been linked to specific diseases as well. C is for clinical. Clinical observations include observations of your hair, fingernails, skin, lips, overall appearance, etc. And you can demonstrate signs of deficiencies or excess of nutrients by these simple clinical observations. And last but not least, D stands for dietary intake. And the measurements of dietary intake would be things like diet history, diet record, food frequency questionnaire, and the 24-hour dietary recall. And these would be used to determine your usual nutrient intake and efficiencies or excesses of various nutrients. So how do we assess your dietary intake? Well, generally we'll do that through questionnaires and interviews. So in order to obtain your dietary intake, you'll have to get diet history data as an aspect for nutritional assessment. And so we have two different major tools to collect dietary intake data. The first would be something called an FFQ, or a food frequency questionnaire. And this is going to help identify the patterns of food intake over time. Then the dietary interview would have a food record, basically a food diary, of all the foods and beverages consumed, how much, when they are eaten over a period of time. And a 24-hour recall is something that would be like a Cliff Notes version of your food record. So instead of having the diary, you would just have a quick assessment by a trained interviewer where the client would then recall, and this would probably be done by a registered diet dietitian, would ask the client to recall all the food and drinks that they've eaten in the previous day. Um, so we can use that anthropomorphic, anthropometric data that I spoke of earlier to measure your body size and body composition. So some of these common measures include height, weight, BMI, or body mass index, waist to hip ratio, weight, uh, waist circumference, growth chart, again that would be for people who are still in the growth stage, so generally children or adolescents, um, and body composition. And then a physical examination could be conducted, which would check for things like um, signs of malnutrition in your hair, your skin, your eyes, fingernails, tongue, and lips. Biochemical data can be collected by laboratory tests. We use that to assess your nutritional status and measure things like the nutrient level in your body fluids, including fluids, including your blood and your urine. Might measure uh, nutrient excretion, for example, or metabolic byproducts of particular nutrients to be able to see what's going on with your metabolic pathways. Multiple national surveys have been developed to be able to assess the nutrient status of a population group. So not of an individual, but of a population as a whole. And assessing the health and nutritional status of Americans is one of the things that they have a top priority. So the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey, or NHANES, it was a series of surveys actually that have sought to evaluate the nutritional status of Americans at multiple different ages. And the Framingham Heart Study collected data from over 10,000 people to establish recommendations um, for cardiovascular disease. Now, what's been determined is that the American diet needs some change. So on the left, we have items that Americans tend to have excessive intake of, things like sugar. Um, sugar in Americans reach 16% of your daily kcal intake, which is a lot. Um, excessive sodium, excessive saturated fats. Too little intake of things like fiber, certain vitamins like vitamin D, potassium and calcium. These are minerals. Um, and while most men tend to meet the recommendation for vitamins and minerals, women tend to be low in iron. 
Um, and oftentimes these dietary practices may be due to where Americans eat, right? Um, oftentimes you're going to eat in the car, right, from a fast food line, buy a prepared meal, or eating in front of the TV or the computer. You're not necessarily getting the nutrients that you need when you're eating for convenience instead of for health. In fact, over 35% of adults are obese, and obesity leads to higher rates of many different long-term diseases, things like diabetes and heart disease, cancer, and stroke. Um, and this is showing prevalence of self-reported obesity, which isn't necessarily accurate because oftentimes obesity begins way before people believe that they are obese. Um, but it shows here that we in Hawaii actually have about 20 to 25% reported obesity. So we're on the lower end of the scale. Here in the Midwest, they have 30 to 35% reported, self-reported obesity as of 2012. So what are the objectives in order to make people healthier? Right? So the idea is the target for Americans at a healthy weight, it's approximately 33%, and currently we're at 30%, so 31%. So we'd like to increase the proportion of adults who are at a healthy weight, reduce the proportion of adults who are obese, which currently sits at about 30%, and we, I'm sorry, currently sits at about 34%, and we wanted about 30%, and also aiming to reduce the proportion of children and adolescents, that would be considered ages 2 to 9, or sorry, 2 to 19, and we'd like to reduce the proportion of those who are obese. Again, the target is about 14 and a half, and we are at about 16. Um, also, additionally, we'd like to increase the contributions of fruit and vegetables to the diet of the individuals aged two years and older. So here's fruits and here's vegetables, and you can see that we are targeting about double what we're actually taking in for the, um, for the fruits, and we are targeting 20% um, more than we're taking in for the vegetables. All right, so this part of the lecture is going to discuss what is credible research. And the field of nutrition tends to be subject to a lot of propaganda, particularly the field of supplements. Everyone wants a get healthy fast fix, right? Um, and so diet trends are constantly changing, popular wisdom constantly changing. But your basic scientific knowledge about nutrition has been consistent for many years now. Um, and so the sound advice, things that are considered sound advice, are going to be based on multiple research findings. So if you find that your reports or your results only come from one report and you can't find that anywhere else, particularly if that report happens to be funded by the same supplement company, you might be wary of the results of that report. So this here is showing a scientific method. Right? So the scientific method starts with an observation and then a question. And the scientific method is basically a specific process scientists use to gather information and test their ideas so that the research findings can be considered solid and sound. And this is a way by which we can make sure that we can actually trust the information that the other scientists around us report. So here's an example of the scientific method. Right? We make an observation and ask a question. Why does cod liver oil cure rickets? So if we know that cod liver oil cures rickets, and we know that there's vitamin A in cod liver oil, the hypothesis might be vitamin A is the curative factor. So we conduct an experiment demonstrating if vitamin A is a factor, then the rats should end up, um, if you feed rats rickets cod liver oil that has no vitamin A in it, and vitamin A is the curative factor, the rats would not be cured, that would support your hypothesis. If you feed the rats cod liver oil that contains no vitamin A, and the rats were still cured, that would say there was something else in cod liver oil that is going to be the curative factor. So your hypothesis would not be supported, and you'd have to go back to the drawing board and revise and formulate a new hypothesis. And that's how the scientific method works. You make an observation, you ask a question, formulate a hypothesis, conduct an experiment, and then based on the results of that experiment, you either support or refute that hypothesis, which means it might send you back to the drawing board. So if you want to believe the findings of some sort of supplemental company, you need to make sure that the findings are published in a peer review journal. Because once a hypothesis is supported, the findings are published. And when the findings are published, that means that everyone gets to throw all of their questions at it and try as hard as possible to debunk that theory. So once your findings become published, other people try to disprove your findings. And if they're unable to disprove them, then we get to a theory and we can start to establish consensus once everyone believes that to be true. All right, And so in order to get to the point where you actually establish consensus, you have to have scientific data. Now scientists use different types of studies to test hypotheses. Generally these are done in a laboratory setting. Um, sometimes that can use lab animals. 
But we have two different types of research. One is observational research, where we are actually going to be just observing. And then we can take that one step further and implement that with experimental research. So observational research is when we are looking at two or more groups to determine the relationship between a disease or a health outcome. Generally, there's going to be a major difference between these two groups, right? Um, whether that is their intake of fat or intake of salt or something like that, or their, their level of exercise. So generally, there'll be a difference between these two groups, and you want to look at the relationship between adding the salt to the diet or removing the salt to the diet has an effect on whatever the disease or health outcome is, right? So whatever it is that you are changing between the two groups and linking that back to whatever the disease or health outcome of interest. Now, observational research can also include epidemiological research, which basically is when we are looking at the disease state in populations of people. So instead of looking at an individual, we're looking at it at an epidemiological level, which would be more of a population level. Now, the next step would be experimental research. And experimental research, again, needs two groups of people, Generally, there's a difference between these people. In this case, the experimental group would be given a treatment that the control group is not given. So the control group would be used as a standard or a comparison, and they'd be given a placebo or an inactive substance. Generally, what you want to do, what's the gold standard, it's what's considered a double-blind placebo study. And what that means is that neither the researchers nor the subjects know who gets the treatment or the placebo. And in this way, the data is most fairly and accurately analyzed. However, in order for this to work, your sample size must be high enough or adequate enough to be able to support the statistics of the results. So here would be a controlled scientific experiment, and we're just going to stick with the subject of rickets, right? So if we have a large number of subjects or individuals that have rickets, and we randomly divide them into groups, one group is the experimental, they receive the vitamin D supplement, the one group is the control, they receive a placebo. No one knows who got the treatment, not the people in the group, not the people who are researching the group. No one knows. And after they receive their treatments, whether it's the supplement or the placebo, then they, then they take a look and see, did anyone get healthy? And then they look at which group were they in, right? So if vitamin D cured rickets in the experimental group, and the control group remained unchanged, then your theory is correct. If it did not occur, you have to go back to the drawing board and revise that hypothesis. So thank you very much for listening to our talk today. I appreciate you coming to lecture, and I will see you again next time when we talk about Unit 2. Aloha, and have a nice day.